shell. Obviously, you know what this stuff was all about, right? It's not a surprise that we showed up tonight. Almost overnight, she went from a possible witness to a person of interest in the case of a missing mom of five from New Canaan. We see state police, New Canaan police, searching downtown Hartford. So what's that about? Why is the scene moved to Hartford? You need to tell us what you know about Jennifer's murder and Forrest Dulles. The girlfriend in the middle of a bitter and brutal divorce battle. The stuff you were throwing out, we have. And it's all Jennifer. It belongs to Jennifer. Do you understand? Turned high profile murder investigation. Guys, what happened to Jennifer, Michelle? You're going to do the right thing, Michelle? We're taking you inside the trial of Michelle Traconis. And thanks for joining us once again inside the trial of Michelle Traconis. I'm Shannon Miller. Happening today, day two of that trial for the woman charged in connection with the presumed murder of New Canaan mom Jennifer Dulos. Here is a live look now at Stanford Superior Court. Yesterday, we first heard from New Canaan and state police, the first investigators involved in the earliest parts of this case. We are watching for Michelle Traconis to make her way into the courtroom right now. We know the witness list law enforcement members from Connecticut State Police. It's likely that we can expect to hear more witness testimony from them today. On Thursday, we saw a lot of brand new evidence in the case, a lot of which has not been seen until now. Most of that was video evidence from Jennifer Dulos's Wells Lane home in New Canaan the night of May 24, 2019, when Jennifer went missing. Jurors were shown a body camera video from one of the officers who responded to the initial missing persons report, which was called in by Jennifer Dulos his babysitter, Lauren Almeida, and Jennifer's friend, Laurel Watts. Now, they told police that Jennifer was going through a divorce with a man who had threatened her in the past and owns a gun. The officers were given access to the home, and you can see them going room by room before ending up in the garage, where they're recorded on that body-worn video of seeing what appeared to be blood-like stains and substances found on and around Jennifer's Range Rover. We will dig in a little bit more to that in just a moment. Now, the trial began with the judge reading the charges against Michelle Traconis, which include conspiracy to commit murder, tampering with evidence, and hindering prosecution. All throughout the trial, Traconis will be sitting at the defense table with the headset on. That is because testimony is being translated into Spanish, her first language. That's all happening through an interpreter. At one point during a new Canaan police lieutenant's testimony, you can even hear the judge ask for the witness to slow down in order for the interpreter to be able to listen and then translate. I want to bring in my colleague Kevin Geis once again, who is reporting from inside the courthouse throughout the trial. Kevin, as you get ready to start covering the second day of testimony, what stood out to you from day one? Yeah, Shannon, it really was sort of a deep dive into the early days of the investigation in New Canaan. New Canaan police officers coming and testifying, talking about gathering all the evidence that they were in those early days, as well as getting a chance to really watch that body camera footage. You're watching the New Canaan Police Department open the garage door, look throughout the garage, move into the house, walk around the house, checking anywhere a person could possibly be. And then you watch their attitudes change. When they go back to the garage, they notice what they assume to be blood on on a Range Rover inside the garage and you watch the entire attitude of those officers change and sort of go into this moment of this may be bigger than just a missing persons case. A dive inside Jennifer Dulos's New Canaan home seen through body camera from May 24th, 2019, the night she was reported missing. Well, it's just strange in connection with the fact that we've got a missing person. The responding officer, Lieutenant Aaron LaTourette with the New Canaan Police Department, the first witness in the trial against Michelle Traconis. We are looking for Jennifer Dulos, the missing person. The police scour the home for the missing mother of five, but find no one, only what they believe to be blood on the front of an SUV parked in the garage. What appeared to be red blood on the front of that vehicle. The state building its case against Michelle Traconis on day one of the trial, starting with the early days of the Dulos disappearance. On top of body cam, there was also ring camera video obtained from Dulos' street the day she disappeared. The burden is on the state. Traconis is being charged with conspiracy to commit murder, evidence tampering and hindering prosecution, among other charges, in the disappearance and presumed murder of Jennifer Dulos. Her family spoke outside of court for day one, maintaining her innocence. On behalf of my daughter, we know that she's innocent. We are trusting 
this uh, fair trial, and I hope the uh, result will be favorable for everybody. And after New Canaan police called in Connecticut State Police, they did an entire video of the entire Wells Lane home. They, it was a crime scene video. You see them go through room by room the entire house and document everything, including personal items, and clothing, things that really gave the entire house a bit of an eerie feeling. It was dark. And then you watch police really hone in, investigators hone in on that garage where they found what they believed to be blood. This entire trial is expected to take about six to eight weeks. Shannon. Kevin, I want to talk with you a little bit now about that first piece of evidence that we saw. Let's talk more about that body camera video. I have to say it really struck to me just the emotion of it all. You see this beautiful New Canaan home on Wells Lane filled with personal items, photos, the belongings of Jennifer and her five children. But it's empty inside that home, even eerie. You see police look at photos of the kids and Jennifer on the walls and on their phones, they try to find her going room to room. So what was your reaction to seeing this video here? Again, this is the first time that we ever saw this. It was. You're watching these police officers sort of walk around the entire home. They're taking pictures of anything that might be relevant to the entire investigation. They stop at one point as they get back to the kitchen. They find her purse or a bag sitting by the garage entrance door. They look inside of it to see if there's anything that could be relevant to where she is or where she was at the time. And you're watching them sort of walk through, as you said, sort of a dark home, an eerie home. They were responding later in the afternoon into the early evening. So it is darker. It's a little eerie but the whole house is lived in. It's as though the whole thing was sort of preserved that Jennifer Dulos, quite literally at the time when she was a missing person, just disappeared. And you're watching sort of police walk into this home and sort of watch a perfectly preserved, lived in home. And then they get back into the garage, they start to notice the blood, and they do have this sort of emotion change when they call in state police and believe there's some it might be something bigger than a missing person's case. Yeah, perhaps the most important uh, piece from this particular uh, video here is the body cam video here presented yesterday during the trial uh, is where New Canaan police officers first see Jennifer's Range Rover in the garage on that home on Wells Lane. Officers aren't sure really anything at this point uh, of anything or that Jennifer is even really missing. They've just gotten a call from her babysitter, from her friend that they haven't heard from her that day. But what gets their attention is what they call blood-like substances on the grill of that vehicle, as well as the bumper and rear fender. And they eventually find other red stains in the garage, including the garage floor, wall, and door. Of uh, course, we're going to play you a part of testimony from New Canaan Police Lieutenant Aaron Latourette, who describes what they saw and what they were thinking. Then the part of that body cam video that depicts those moments. Take a look here. Uh, I looked at the vehicle and noticed that there was uh, what appeared to be red blood on the front of that vehicle. Can you please describe what you saw? Uh, a red mark on the grill area of the vehicle. Um, and again, it drew my attention because it didn't match the color of the grill, didn't match the color of the vehicle. Was there any damage to the vehicle? No, we did not. We looked at the vehicle, uh, did not observe any damage. Initially, Officer Blank and myself discussed it possibly could be a deer strike. It could be a deer. It was wiped at some point, but dry first. Dry edges, what's that? Yeah, when he just called in, he had a lot of stuff on. There's some back here, too. Is there? Yeah, down here, too. Strange. It's like a pattern here. You know what I mean? It's clue. Right, not fur. But there, it's, it's up here, too. It's hard to get any of this. This camera here. We should get better cameras. Hopefully, this is getting it, though. Right? Usually, if you hit a deer and there's blood in your car, you take it to the car wash and get it cleaned. Especially a Range Rover. 
Now, all of that evidence that they're looking at in the garage ended up being sent to the state forensics lab. Here's a look at what's found there. This is from Michelle Traconis's arrest warrant. Eight samples of what investigators called blood-like stains from Jennifer Dulos's Range Rover, the garage, and the kitchen sink, faucet, and cabinet tested positive for Jennifer's DNA. Some of those stains also contained Fotis Dulos's DNA found on the kitchen sink faucet and the doorknob of the mudroom door. So Kevin, we knew about the DNA found in those stains. What we're getting for the first time is the behind the scenes perspective from those investigators who worked this case. I could talk a little bit more about, uh, again, this going from arrest warrant, something we've read about to finally seeing it in this video. Absolutely. It, it's almost alarming in a way you sort of you understand what police were sort of working with when you're able to read it but then you actually can see the amount the different droplets in certain parts of the Range Rover you're seeing inside the home you're seeing different ways that police are moving and navigating through her home and you're watching sort of everything inside the garage how much space there was in the garage and then you're watching sort of this larger pool of what again what investigators believe to be blood on one side of the vehicle and you understand sort of what investigators were working with in the early parts of their investigation. Uh, Kevin, the final piece of video evidence played out in court on day one is this video taken by state police detectives who were called in documenting the crime scene. This is what it looked like when they went through and took video of the kitchen. One of the detectives testified that it was a systematic way that they capture every aspect of a crime scene. They start taking video outside and then they go inside room by room. They said the size of home on Wills Lane created its own challenges. This video here played out in court was about an hour long. Now, when asked if there was a particular area that they focused on when taking this video, that detective replied the garage. As you saw in the body camera video earlier, there were a number of those what investigators called blood like stains found inside. Now, this is the best look that we have ever gotten at the evidence we have known about for years. Among those stains, this red stain that looks like a shoe print on the floor of the garage. There's also a red smear on the floor, which was depicted in that state police footage. The evidence on the Range Rover, you can see police shine a flashlight on red spots on the side of the car, then the red substance on the front of the car in the grill area. So the jury has the body camera video from New Canaan Police, the crime scene documentation video from state police now to consider. What do you think, Kevin, is the benefit for them to not only hear from these detectives, but see it from their own eyes and how these police conducted their investigation? Absolutely. The jury has a chance to sort of really sit through a deep dive into what investigators were seeing again at the very early stages of this investigation. And what really struck me that the jury had the chance to watch was how fast investigators were able to sort of switch this entire thing from the possibility of a missing person to something larger, something that they had to call in state police. State police spent a long time, again, over an hour, and they split it up into two different sessions videoing the entire home perfectly preserving everything that was inside that home. And the defense even had the chance to ask one of the state police detectives that did the video if they were worried that New Canaan was in the home and sort of did their own scan of the entire home beforehand. And the investigator said that that was not something that they were necessarily too worried about because they were able to see the body cam later on from New Canaan Police Department. So you sort of watching the jury sort of go through this entire early phase of the investigation and get a sense of what investigators were looking at at the very beginning of this entire investigation. Yeah, and Kevin, uh, you know, the, the jurors have now had a night to sleep on this, kind of absorb that video that they've seen. They've got their work cut out for them because there is a tremendous amount of evidence that's going to be presented in this case. Uh, sitting in the courtroom yesterday, I couldn't help but see what I, I appear to see as a very engaged uh, jury pool here. Uh, they've got a lot to uh, learn, a lot to absorb. We appreciate you bringing us the very latest this morning, Kevin, outside Stanford Superior Court, where things are expected to get started here at 10 a.m. We will get you uh, up to date on the latest information. Kevin will bring you much more as we learn more throughout the trial, which again, day two, expected to start today. Much more inside the trial, Michelle Draconis. We're going to bring in one of our legal experts to talk about the challenges for both the defense and the prosecution in this convoluted case, stay with us. We'll be right back.
and welcome back to Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. I am joined now by one of our expert analysts, attorney Jim Bergen. Thank you so much for being with us today. A lot to talk about. Um, I got to get to it this part. What makes this case so unique uh, and unlike any other criminal case that we have seen here in Connecticut? Well, first is they have to recreate a murder. And what we saw yesterday is they did a very good job of getting all the jurors to get back into that moment when this goes from missing person to, my goodness, we may have a murder. And they got all the jurors to feel how that must have felt. And the, the police at that time are doing everything in their power mm -hmm. to calm the public down because the people in the public, the rest of us, yeah. are watching this carefully. Right, and you remember uh, folks that lived in New Canaan there, once they started hearing again that a mom had gone missing, there was, you know, those missing flyers that went up for her, uh, police there searching around, showing people her picture, have you seen this woman? Um, so that's kind of recreating and taking the jurors back to, to that moment, that initial moment that she was reported missing. What do you expect, Jim, are gonna be the biggest challenges, both for the state and for the defense? Well, for the state, they're doing everything perfectly so far, which is to recreate that panic that everybody felt. They are coincidentally recreating the panic the police felt. So they weren't at that time concerned with, how are we gonna get Michelle Traconis? All they're thinking about is, we gotta go find this woman. We gotta see if we can save her and stop her. What they haven't done, and this is the real challenge about the rest of this case, is they haven't done any focus on, well, what is likely to be in Michelle Traconis's brain? Mm -hmm. That's what the case is about. And you know how dangerous and manipulative Fotis Doulis is. And we all know people who've been through divorces, and we know that there's a lot of antagonism. Everybody hates everybody <laughs> during those situations. On the other hand, when they go out and start dating somebody new, what do they present? Their very best face. So there's no evidence I've not yet seen that shows the police focusing on, well, what is Fotis Doulis doing to try to get Michelle Traconis to like him? It's not... By the way, I just killed the mother of my five kids. He's presenting the opposite of that. And it would appear, just from common sense, Tr Michelle Traconis is taking it at face value. And, and maybe we will hear later on in the trial exactly what Michelle knew uh, about the divorce proceedings, the contentious divorce proceedings, how much Fotis Dulos really looped her in. Uh, and again, at this point that we've seen so far, the jurors don't even know who Michelle Traconis is. The police don't even know who Michelle Traconis is. So again, this is just the initial stages of the investigation. All police have been told at this point that there is a missing mom. Uh, she's going through a contentious divorce, and this man has been known to make threats to her according to what Jennifer has told her friends and family. Uh, let me ask you this. The body, uh, I think that's what captures this case the most. Uh, people seem to be still, um, the case shrouded so much in mystery because there has been no body that's been found. Uh, so how does that play into all of this, Jim? Well, first, it doesn't help the prosecution that they don't have a body. But it doesn't help the defense either, because if you're a juror, you're thinking, this is weird. Um, and you might start imagining all kinds of things. We don't try people and put them in prison based on our imagination. It has to be based on evidence. And I don't know whether we're ever going to see any evidence in this whole trial that speaks to what's going on with her. But the missing body just sparks everyone's imagination mm -hmm. to fill in the missing blanks. Right, and unless these jurors have been living under a rock, at this point, there's not been any evidence presented that there has not been a body found in this case. So based on, uh, again, this was a case when they were picking the jury pool, uh, that they were not um, thinking that anyone was coming in here necessarily, never hearing about the story at all. But again, uh, we know at this point, at least, of what's been presented in court, there has not been any mention of that a body has not been found yet. So why bring in evidence from Wells Lane, um, even though Michelle Draconis was never at that scene? Well, because they have to, in order to prosecute a case for conspiracy to commit a murder, they have to prove 
a murder. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen so far is that component. They are trying to prove there's a murder. They eventually have to pivot to try to show that some kind of way this woman that Fotis is trying to seduce to become part of his life is being brought in on that murder. I'm not sure how much they're going to get besides that dumping of the bags. Mm -hmm. I think the whole case comes down to dumping bags. And again, it, did she know what was Fotis was doing that day? That's the big question. Uh, Jim, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, more legal analysis from Jim coming up. Next, we're going to take a look at the burden of proof, how it plays into the case and what it means for the jury as they consider their verdict. Stick around for more of Inside the Trial of Michelle Traconis. And welcome back to Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. We are joined once again by attorney Jim Bergen to talk about this very high profile case. Jim, thanks for being here. I want to step back into the very beginning of this trial when the jury is brought in and the judge addresses them about the serious duty that they are being asked to carry out. Judge Kevin Randolph first reads through each of those charges against Michelle Draconis. Then he outlines for the jury what they need to know, including the important distinction that every defendant is a criminal case, in a criminal case, is presumed innocent. Every defendant in a criminal case is presumed innocent. And as we explained to you earlier, the presumption of innocence works this way. If you were asked right now whether Michelle Traconis was guilty or innocent, the answer is not, I don't know. The answer is not guilty because you have heard nothing to overcome the presumption of innocence. That presumption remains unless you unanimously decide that the state has proven guilt beyond a reasonable, uh, reasonable doubt for each of the offenses. The burden is on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is called the burden of proof. The burden of proof never shifts to the defendant. And Jim, that example the judge Randolph gave really does drive home the point, the burden of proof. Talk about that and the challenges it presents both for the prosecution and the defense. Our country is unlike any other country in the world. It's the product of hundreds of years of development of common law into constitutional law. And this presumption of innocence, which was very eloquently described simply and powerfully by this very good judge, means that she is not going to be found guilty if this jury is following the law unless or until the state can get enough evidence in front of them. Not conjecture, not, oh, must have, I got a feeling, actual evidence of her frame of mind. And they have to believe unanimously that beyond any reasonable doubt, she was in knowledge of his killing. Mm -hmm. At the time of the killing, conspiracy to commit murder is a charge that suggests, requires, beyond a reasonable doubt, she, at the time of the killing, joined that intent. I haven't seen anything on that, but I also don't, fault the state for presenting what they've got, it is a kind of case that, well, we'll see how that evolves. Yeah. I haven't yet seen the evidence yeah. of her state of mind at the time of the killing. And I think that is just the crux of all of this, right? The Honorable uh, uh, Judge Kevin Randolph, again, presiding over this trial. He is a senior judge for Stanford Superior Court. Jim, uh, you know about Judge Randolph. How do you think he's going to handle this very high-profile trial in his courtroom? Well, I'm really glad that you showed that clip because that shows the Kevin Randolph that I've known for 30 years. He's very calm. He's um, somebody who you want to be hanging with, and he's going to keep everybody feeling calm so that they can do their job. He's very bright. Went to Wesleyan. He got his master's in communication at Syracuse. I mean, who does that and becomes <laughs> a judge? Um, he's taught how to be a, a, a yeah. trial lawyer. And importantly, he's on the faculty teaching other judges. Yeah. So his disposition 
is just what this case needs. He had a calming effect in that newsroom. Those jurors know that they have got a big task on their hands. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for being with us today and joining us. We appreciate your insight and knowledge. NBC Connecticut is bringing you exclusive in-depth coverage of the trial of Michelle Draconis on multiple platforms. I'll be taking you inside a deep dive of the trial every weekday at 9 a.m. on our NBC Connecticut streaming channel. I'll be joined by a team of experts to help me break down the case. They include Brian Foley, the former spokesperson for the Connecticut Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection. You heard from him yesterday. Eric Carita is a forensic DNA consultant and attorneys Jim Bergen, who we've had on today, as well as Michael Fitzpatrick and Trent Lalima. Trent and Mike will be joining us on Tuesday. There is no court on Monday because it is a holiday. That wraps up our exclusive Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis streaming special. You can watch the trial live on our streaming channels beginning here in about a half hour at 10 a.m. We will have live coverage on ABC Connecticut starting with the news at 4. Be sure to join us Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more in-depth analysis of the trial as it unfolds. Thanks for watching.